Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala hamma ba'd. Just a kind request to to the brothers inshallah if you can come closer into the middle inshallah. We're not social distancing. Inshallah. The etiquette of the majlis is to sit together inshallah. That's how the sahaba radiyallahu anhum sat. And that's where the barakah and the nur and the light of Allah Azza wa Jal descends right there in the middle, inshaAllah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillah, wa salat wa salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walaha ma ba'du fa'ud billahi min ashaytani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusallun ala nabiyya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala abdika wa rasulik wa salli ala al-mu'minina wa al-mu'minati wa al-muslimina wa al-muslimat. وبارك على محمد وأزواجه وذريته. Respected brothers and sisters, inshallah, we'll be continuing from where we left off last week. In the previous lesson, we were studying the history of Adhan. We're still covering the earlier period of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam's Medinan life after migration to the city of Medina Munawwara. So today, inshallah, we're going to be continuing from that discussion and some of the other incidences that occurred within the first and second year. After Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's arrival in Medina Munawwara, in the discussion of Adhan, we spoke about the wordings of Adhan. We spoke about the different muadzinin, the different muadzinun, the different Adhan callers in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One thing we didn't mention, and somebody reminded me of it today, was the Adhan of Salatul Fajr and how the Adhan of Salatul Fajr differs from the rest of the Adhan. So if you notice in the Adhan of Salatul Fajr, if you're awake, of course, is, or if you've been to a Muslim land or land in which the Adhan is called aloud in the loudspeaker, you would notice a variation in the Adhan of Fajr after the words, Hayya ala al-Falah, the Mu'addin, the caller to Adhan says, As-salatu khayrun min an prayer is better than sleep. And he repeats this twice. Only in the Adhan of Salatul Fajr. As-salatu khayrun min al-nawm. As-salatu khayrun min al-nawm. So what's the history of these wordings? Where did they come from? It's mentioned that on one occasion, Bilal radiallahu anhu came to inform the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Salatul Fajr. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had fallen asleep. Now it was the practice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to offer Salatul Tahajjud. The night prayer that was his regular daily habit whereas it is optional for the rest of the ummah for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it wasn't an option the hajjud was mandatory upon rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but after salatul tahajjud between tahajjud and salatul fajr nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam would take a brief nap or just lie down and it's human nature sometimes, you might fall asleep. So on one occasion, Bilal radiallahu anhu, who was the appointed caller for the adhan, comes to inform the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that it's Salatul Fajr time and he was asleep. So Bilal radiallahu anhu uttered the words, As-salatu khayrun min al-nawm, as-salatu khayrun min al-nawm. Salah is better than sleep, salah is better than sleep. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard about this and then he legislated that these wordings should be included in the adhan of Salatul Fajr. So this is the history behind the wordings, the extra wordings in the adhan of Salatul Fajr. Now, let's speak about the first year after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa arrival in Medina. As you can understand some of the things that we had already discussed the things that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa implemented, the construction of the new masjid, the brotherhood between the community to establish unity and camaraderie and helping one another standing on their own two feet, helping others settle down into the community, into new life. We spoke about the charter of Medina, the constitution of Medina. We spoke about the legislation of Adhan. Some other things happened within this first year. One of them was Kulthum bin Hadam. Does anybody remember the name Kulthum bin Hadam? It's okay if you don't remember it. 
So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Mecca before he arrives in Medina, where does he stay? Which town? Which town? The first masjid, Quba. And whose house did he stay out? Stay at? The house of Kulthum bin Hadam. So only a few months later, Kulthum bin Hadam passes away. So that was something that happened in the first year after Rasulullah wasallam's arrival in Medina Munawwara, the person who hosted him in Quba, he passes away. Then when Rasulullah wasallam was in Medina after arriving, what's the first thing he does? He constructs the masjid. But even before the completion of the construction of the masjid, As'ad bin Zurara radiallahu anhu passes away. Who is As'ad bin Zurara? As'ad bin Zurara radiallahu anhu was from the Banu Najjar. Banu Najjar were the maternal relatives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He stayed with them, Banu Najjar. And As'ad bin Zurara was the guardian of the two orphans from whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa purchased the land for masjid. And As'ad bin Zurara was also appointed as the chief of the new Muslims of Medina few years before that few years prior to that when the Medinan people came during the Hajj season to Mecca and they took the pledge with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in what is known as Bay'atul Aqaba so of course for the brothers and sisters who might have not been following in the past the origins or you can say the beginnings of Islam in Medina started with the group of people that came during the Hajj season to Mecca when the Prophet Sallallahu was banned from publicly calling people to Islam but he would go in secrecy during the Hajj season and invite the people and it was on that occasion when he met a few people from Medina they returned the following year with more people so Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa appointed As'ad bin Zurara radiallahu anhu as the naqib and the chief. He was senior, he was respected, he was elderly. So now when the people came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said As'ad bin Zurara has passed away, now who should you appoint as the chief? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, you are my maternal relatives, I will be the chief. And they were extremely elated and happy. Because now he is in Medina already. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says this, and this is considered to be one of the uh, manaqib. Manaqib means uh, a matter of rank and status for the people of Banu Najjar, that tribe. That tribe Banu Najjar used to take pride in the fact that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became their naqib, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became the chief of their tribe. So that's something else that occurs during the first year of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's migration to Medina Munawwara. In the same year, two chiefs from the Quraysh in Mecca, from the polytheists of Mecca, pass away. One of them was Walid bin Mughira, the father of Khalid bin Walid. He had not accepted Islam. He was considered to be the chief of the Meccans, even above Abu Jahl. So he had passed away. Another chief of the Meccans passed away. His name was As bin Wa'il. He was the father of Amr bin As, who was the companion of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, appointed as the governor during the caliphate of the earlier Khilafah. Upon where? Does anybody remember where? Sham. Was it Sham? Or was it Egypt? It was Egypt. Amr bin As radiallahu anhu was appointed upon Egypt. Right, so, and then his son was Abdullah bin Amr, who was one of the famous, well-learned companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So these are important figures, so that's why we're mentioning this point here. Then, in the same year, now some say it happened in the first year, some say it happened in the second year. After Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa arrival in Medina Munawwara, his marriage to Aisha radiallahu anha, 
is completed and consummated. And we're going to share more details about that in the following weeks, inshallah. Now, one of the other things that happens in this first year is that the early migrants that migrated from Mecca to Medina, we mentioned in the past that it was difficult for them to settle. They did not find the water of Medina to be favorable. Uh, they didn't find the, the climate of Medina to be fav favorable. Just like people that come from hot, hotter climates to colder climates and vice versa, people find a difficulty in adjusting. So the Sahaba, the earlier migrants, Muhajirun from Mecca to Medina, they found it difficult to settle and adjust. They didn't like the water much. But there was one particular well known as the well of Rumah, from which the Sahaba, earlier companions, migrants, Muhajirin, they were purchasing water. Now the owner of that well, he was from the Banu Ghifar tribe, and he was selling them the water. He was selling them water, for, uh, uh, one handful of food, the, the measure that's mentioned is uh, uh, mud. Mud is a scale that they used to use in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And if you were to describe mud today, it would be your handful, like your two hands together when you fill it, uh, and you fill it up with something like water or something, that would be one mud. Now it's mentioned that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa used to make wudu with only that much water. Right, and that's very difficult to practice. We usually have the taps running very fast. Um, so people would come with their skin bags to fetch water from Biruma, and the person who owned Biruma, he would be selling the water to the people. Now Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to him and offered him this, uh, I'm going to just uh, pull this up inshallah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offered him um, to purchase the well of him. Because it's, this was difficult. You can imagine when water is scarce and there's only one or two spaces or places that you can find water that, you, that is uh, favorable to you and your, your climate and your temperament, your health. But it's being sold in expensive quantities or it is for very expensive price. It's very difficult for people. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted to purchase that well so that the believers can drink from that well. But this man from the Banu Ghifar tribe, he wasn't in a position to be able to sell it for a small sum. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, sell this to me and Allah will give you a well or a fountain in paradise or a stream in Jannah. He said, oh Rasulullah, my family has nothing but this. Now this news reached the ears of whom? Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Now Allah had blessed him. You know, we always have brothers and sisters in the community, mashallah. Whenever they hear that somebody is in need, they always respond. Whenever they hear that there's a family in need, they respond. Somebody can't pay for their janazah, they respond. Always. There's brothers and sisters like that, mashallah. So Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu was one of those. Now he heard what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was offering. What was the offer? The offer is, you buy this or you give this in the path of Allah, Allah will give you a stream in paradise. So Uthman radiallahu anhu comes and he purchases it. Purchases it for how much? 35,000 dirham. So he pays a very large, hefty sum for this. An offer that he can't resist. Right? The seller cannot resist that type of offer. 35,000 dirham. Then he came, comes to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Oh Rasulullah, are you going to give me what you are offering him? If I give this in the path of Allah, will you give me what you were offering that Ansari, that, that man from Banu Ghifar tribe? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, yes. He says, Oh Rasulullah, I have given this well to the, for the believers. So he gave it as a waqf, as an endowment for the people to benefit. So there are numerous narrations about this. Um, Uthman radiallahu anhu himself says that when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa came to Medina, there was no sweet water besides Bi'ruma. 
And you know, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Who's going to purchase this?" And I purchased it. And Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi also narrates a, a, a narration that is similar to this. Now, some narrations say that he dug a well. It's possible that he dug around it, and then there was water from the stream going into both places. Allahu alam. Both of them can be possible. So this is what happens again in the first year after migrating to Medina Munawwara. Now something else interesting that happens, and this is to do with the subject of Salah. When Salah was first ordained, it was ordained in Mi'raj, the night journey. Fajr was two rak'ahs, Maghrib was three rak'ahs, but Dhuhr, Asr and Isha were also two, two, two. Initially, originally, Dhuhr, Asr and Isha were also two, two, two units of prayer. They were not four as we perform them today. What happens? Aisha radiallahu anha says, Salah, when it was ordained first, it was two rak'ah. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrates to Medina Munawwara and then it became four rak'ah. While the prayer during travels remained the same the prayer during travels remained the same. In another narration, Aisha radiallahu anha says, the first thing that was ordained upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was prayer. Two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs for every prayer except for Maghrib. Maghrib was three rak'ahs. Then Allah azza wa jal completed the number for Dhuhr, Asr and Isha during residence when you're not traveling as four units, while travelers, for them, the salah was still settled two, 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 except for Maghrib, of course. Maghrib is always three rakahs because you can't half that. So these are numerous narrations about the faradiyya and the obligation of salah. Now, Based on this, now this is like a nerdy sort of like a fiqh issue. You might know that according to some of the fuqaha and the jurists, when you're traveling, shortening the prayer to two is not an option, is a must. So Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, he says when you're traveling, Fajr, Maghrib, everybody unanimously agrees that Fajr will remain two, Maghrib will remain three. But Dhuhr, Asr and Isha, according to Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, you have to perform two, you can't perform four, unless you're praying behind a resident imam. So you're going to the local masjid, you're a traveler, you're supposed to be praying two, but you're praying behind a resident imam, an imam who's not a traveler, and he's going to be praying four for Dhuhr, four for Asr, four for Isha, you will pray four behind him, you won't cut your salah after two and walk off. Because now the salah of the imam is your salah. So Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi says that it's not a choice. Imam al-Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi says it's a choice. Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi says evidence is this hadith. That salah when it was ordained was 2-2-2. Aisha radiallahu anha says after migration Allah completed it to 4 while the travelers salah still remained 2 which was the original number. Now based on that, there is another offshoot ruling, which is according to Abu Hanifa, even if your travel is motivated by sin, you are still granted the concession to pray two, two, two. So if you were traveling with the intention of robbing someone's house, don't do that. Inshallah, you never have to do that. But if your motivation to travel was to steal from someone or to commit some type of sin, Abu Hanifa says that that will not affect, that will not affect the number of units that you pray. You'll still be praying two, two, two. Imam al-Shafi'i is saying that since two is a concession, concessions are not granted to sinners. So if your intention to travel is sin, you will complete four, 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 for dhuhr, asr and isha. These are just some things that I thought I'll, I'll share with you guys. Because sometimes when you hear the differences of opinions amongst the fuqaha, 
then it piques your interest though. What is the reasoning? Why is one faqih saying this, one jurist is saying this, one jurist is saying that, one, one alim is saying this, one alim is saying that. So they're working with these evidences, right? They're working with these evidences. Let me see if there's anything else to share, inshallah, from this particular discussion. No, there's not. Okay. Now, another issue that arised, and this is to do with, again, community, right? This was Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't want the entire city of Medina to become empty. And what he, we mean by this is, of course, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is in one part of the city, which is the masjid area, he lived right adjacent to the masjid. And now there is a newly constructed masjid where people are gathering and praying and learning and studying and engaging and socializing. Everything's happening there. So there's a desire for the different tribes to move closer. But what would happen if everybody moves too close to the masjid? The city becomes empty, the outskirts will become empty. So when Rasulullah settled in Medina Munawwara, the tribe of Salama, Banu Salama, they wanted to leave their abodes and their village and they wanted to come closer to the masjid. So they came to Rasulullah seeking permission. Oh Rasulullah, we want to move closer to the masjid while they were on the outskirts of the city, further away from the masjid. They wanted to come closer. Rasulullah didn't want Medina to become empty. It would also uh, encourage any enemies. If there are no tribes on the outskirts, it would encourage enemies to raid the town and, and to attack. So Nabi وسلم, prohibited them. He said to them, no, he, he stopped them from doing so. Imam Muslim mentions in his Sahih on the authority of Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu anhuma that he says that our houses were a little distant from the masjid and we intended to sell our homes and come closer to the masjid. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa stopped us, prohibited us and said, Inna lakum bi kulli khutwatin darajah. Every footstep you take to the house of Allah, you will receive a rank in Jannah. And in another hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Diyarakum, stick to your home. Tuktab atharukum. Your footsteps are recorded. Every footstep you take in the masjid or to the masjid. And we learn from this a beautiful thing. The khair and the good that you're about to do is salah. But the means that you take to get there can also be rewarding if you have sincerity. So walking is a mundane activity, but your walking is with, well, it's not always mundane, but it's, it's purposeful and meaningful too. But you're walking, and you could be walking for any purpose, but when your walking is purposeful, it becomes rewarding. If your walking is to stay healthy so you can worship Allah, your walking is rewarded. So this is a very important thing. Now, the question then arises is, how about in our context? In our context, should we be living further away from the masjid? Or closer to the masjid. So in our context, there would be virtue to live around the masjid, closer. Why? Because we don't have numerous masajid. And distances that we live away from the masjid could be such that it deters us from attending salah in congregation. So we have to look at our context. We're not living in a Muslim society or Muslim land. We're living in as a, as, a, as a minority, of course, as a religious group. And we don't have necessarily masajid every single place. So whatever is going to encourage you to attend the masjid frequently, that is the course of action that should be taken. Now, what also another thing that we should mention here is that sometimes it might be more rewarding to go to the further masjid because of the rewards. So you might have a masjid closer to your home, but because there's extra effort in going to a masjid that is at a distance, there is extra reward and more reward in doing so. However, if there is fear that by your passing one masjid and going to a further masjid, that masjid closest to you will not be populated, won't be well attended, it will be empty, then we should avoid doing that. So that question always comes up. People ask, 
Is it okay for me to sub bypass one masjid and go to another? Should I bypass the masjid that is closest to my house? We have a responsibility to increase the attendance in our local masjid. So we should do that. If we have a masjid close to us, we should try to attend that masjid more than the masjid that is further away. Now, of course, if that masjid further away has some classes, some programs, some activity, that's a different matter. But when it comes to our general performance of salah, attendance for salah, we should try to prioritize the masajid that are closest to us so that they don't become empty. So that they don't become empty. This is also very important, inshallah. The next thing that I want to speak about is um, something that also happens in this time is the changing of the qibla. Right, so this happens actually in the second year. I'm going to mention... I was going to mention two things. One of them was uh, about the Ashab al-Suffa and the second one was about Tahweel al-Qibla. But I think we're going to um, just suffice on one of them uh, for time purposes. Let's inshallah uh, speak about that. So it's, again, we're speaking about the first and second year of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa arrival in the city of Medina Munawwara. What are some of the significant things that are happening in the community some of the significant establishments of different ibadat and worships, some of the changes that are coming about in the community. One of them was the direction of the prayer. Where do Muslims pray towards when they perform their salah? Now, of course, in today, today's day and age and from this time onwards, the qibla, the direction of the prayer, has been settled, established as Al Masjid al Haram, the uh, honorable house of Allah, the sacred house of Allah, which, uh, the sacred masjid, right, which is in Mecca Mukarramah. And I'm using these particular terms, Al Masjid al Haram, and not the Kaaba, for a reason. And I'm going to explain in a few minutes, inshallah. The direction for prayer is Al Masjid al Haram, the sacred masjid. And the sacred masjid is the masjid in Mecca Mukarramah. But historically, was that always the Qibla? Or was there another Qibla for the Muslims? Amongst the ulama, there are two opinions regarding this matter. One of them is the opinion of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhumah, who is the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and also one of the most learned scholars of this ummah, known as the Mufassir of the Qur'an, the commentator of the Qur'an, the exegete of the Qur'an. Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma says that the original direction for salah was not al-masjid al-haram, rather it was baytul muqaddas al-masjid al-aqsa, which is in Jerusalem. However, he says that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would perform the prayer in the direction of the Kaaba in such a way that he is also facing Baytul Muqaddas at the same time. How would that be possible? Now we know that the Kaaba has four corners. One of them is where the Al Hajar al Aswad, the black stone, is situated. And before that, when we make the Tawaf and we do it counterclockwise, the last corner before that is known as the Yemeni corner. And then there's the Sham corner, Sham is Syria, and then there's Iraq corner. So if I remember correctly, when we're making tawaf counterclockwise, because tawaf is performed counterclockwise, right? Anticlockwise, basically. You start from al-hajar al-aswad, the, the black stone, and you're working your way up. First, you will cross the Iraqi corner. Then you will cross the Sham corner. Sham is Syria. Then you will pass by the Yemen corner. And then you will make your way back to al-hajar al-aswad, so Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa would stand between Al-Hajar al-Aswad and the Yemeni corner. So he's facing the Kaaba, but he's also facing Bayt al-Muqaddas at the same time. So that is the opinion of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Then what happens is after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa migrates to Medina Munawwara, he continues, that's not possible now. When he moves to Medina, because Medina is north of Mecca. It's not possible for him to face both directions at the same time. Either he's going to face Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem or he's going to face Ka'batullah in Mecca, the Qibla in uh, Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca. But he continues facing Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. But the desire of his heart was 
that the Kaaba be the Qibla, that the Qibla be Al Masjid Al Haram. Why? Because that was the Qibla of his forefathers Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. Some of the ulama, some actually from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum also, are of the opinion that the original Qibla was always Al Masjid Al Haram in Makkah Mukarramah, the grand sacred mosque in Mecca. However, when the Prophet Sallallahu migrated to Medina Munawwara, Allah instructed him to face Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in prayer. And that happened for approximately 16 or 17 months. And then Allah instructed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to face Al-Masjid Al-Haram. So the original was Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And for a momentary time, he faced Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And then again, he comes back and reverts back to original Qibla, the original uh, uh, direction, which is Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Now, based on these two opinions, what is the reasoning? Why would it be from Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhumah's perspective that the Qibla first be Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and that continues to remain 16, 17 months after migration and then it diverts back to Mecca. So Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma is saying that the community in Mecca were polytheists. The community in Medina were the Jewish community, people of the scripture, people of the book. Now, in order to distinguish himself and to establish a clear distinction between his practices and the practices of the polytheists of Mecca, he was facing Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Salah. And when he migrates to Medina Munawwara, he continues to do this until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the instruction and gives him directions to now face Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca. The other group who say, that the original Qibla and direction was always Al-Masjid Al-Haram but after migrating to Medina Munawwara the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for a momentary time is instructed to face Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Salah they say the reasoning for that was because now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in the city of Medina and one of his primary addressees and the community that he's interacting with and conveying the truth of Islam to is the Jewish community. And in order to endear them, in order to bring them closer, in order to attract them towards his message, to create familiarity with them, he faced the same direction that they would face in prayer. And then later when it was established, 16 or 17 months later, that this group is hell-bent on their opposition, that they are stubborn and they are not going to accept the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah azza wa jal instructed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come back. So these are the different opinions given by the uh, uh, ulama regarding the direction of the Qibla. Now there are numerous things to learn, um, numerous things that can be extracted from this as well. And uh, one of them is from the wording itself. Allah says, and these are the verses in the Quran around that time. Allah says, فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَطَرَ الْمَسْجِدِ Haram." Turn your face in the direction of Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Allah does not say turn your face in the direction of the Kaaba. Because you can only directly face the Kaaba in Salah if it's in front of you. For the people that are living at a distance from the Kaaba, it's almost impossible for them to face the exact Ka'batullah completely. It's almost difficult, almost impossible. Therefore, Allah Azza wa granted more flexibility in the matter and said, face the direction of the sacred masjid. The sacred masjid is very wide. 
which also tells us that if there's a deviation from the exact Kaaba for people that are not in Mecca, for people that are outside of Mecca, if there's a slight deviation of about up to 45 degrees, then that salah is still valid. Keep this in mind. Because this debate comes up a lot. Sometimes people go into masajid and they take out their compasses. Google.com, Qibla, Finder. And then they start to say, oh, this masjid prays in the wrong direction. Oh, that masjid is praying in the wrong direction. Oh, that masjid is praying in the wrong direction. So technology is a blessing and a curse as well at the same time. And then people start to cause fitna. Now they start telling Musallin, oh, you know your salah is not right in this masjid. Then people start to doubt their prayer. Then people start to fight. And the matter has already been established maybe 20, 30 years ago when that masjid was established. There might be a slight deviation of up to 47, 48, up to around that much. And there's permission to have that. So that's fine. There's no, no issue with that at all. This is agreed upon. Now, going back to the verses. In the verses, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the reason why the Qibla is being changed. And that allows us to understand the different opinions that we just shared a couple of minutes ago. Allah says, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ مَنْ يَنْقَلِبُ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ We did not make the Qibla, the direction of the prayer which you were on, except so that we may establish who truly follows the messenger from those who turn on their heels. What is Allah saying here? What Allah is saying here is that the most important concept in our faith after bringing faith in Allah Azza wa Jal is submission to his commands ita'ah and obedience when a person has fully acknowledged and believed that Allah is their master their creator the legislator then they fully accept whatever Allah has ordained and they fully reject and resist and stay away from what Allah has prohibited if Allah says you face this direction in your prayer, the believer doesn't ask questions. The believer says, Sami'na wa ata'na. We heard and we obeyed. When the Prophet ﷺ migrates to Medina Munawwara and he's familiarizing himself with the people of the book and some of them are coming closer to him because he's also facing the Qibla in prayer. He's also facing their direction, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa originally. Now Allah wants to expose who is truthful in their following of Islam and who is hypocritical. So when the direction of the Qibla changes from what they had considered sacred, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, to Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca, it exposed those individuals who are not sincere in following Islam. Allah says, وَإِن كَانَتْ لَكَبِيرَةً إِلَّا عَلَى الَّذِينَ هَدَى اللَّهِ even though changing the direction of the Qibla might have been burdensome, except upon those whom Allah has guided. Allah then goes on to say, Allah will not waste your faith. And here faith has been interpreted as prayer. Because some people started spreading false rumors. What happened to all your past prayers then? Your past prayers are gone. No reward for that. Says Allah is comforting the believers. Allah will not waste your prayers. Whatever was offered in the past, that's fine. It's not an issue. Now, when these commands were revealed, we know that there were different localities in which salah was taking place in congregation. One of them was the Masjid of Banu Salima, this tribe that we were speaking about earlier. One person went and he started making the announcement that the Qibla has changed. Some people were in Salah. This happened around noon or a little bit afternoon. Some say it was Dhuhr, some say Asr time. So this person enters the masjid which is now not today known as which masjid? 
Masjid Qiblatayn, the Masjid of two Qibla. Why is it called Masjid Qiblatayn? Because it was announced while the people were in prayer that the Qibla has changed. And they were so strong in their submission to Allah that during the prayer they changed their direction. And it's interesting because even the women, one of the Sahabiyat, she says that we changed during the, uh, the Salah and we also had to step forward. Because think about it. The rows of women are behind the rows of men. If they just, if they just turned around, what would happen? If you're facing in that direction, the men are at front, or this direction, let's just say this direction. This is the direction of Qibla. Actually, let's take that one because that is the correct one now. So let's just say the doors there, the men are at the front, women are at the back. If they were just to turn around, what would happen? The women would be at the front, the men would be at the back. So this is not how they did it. What they had to do was, the women had to step forward and the men are stepping around like this on their right, towards their right, until they, their rows are at the front and the women's rows were behind them. So this is also something that happened during that time. Now the philosophy behind the Qibla, why Al-Masjid Al-Haram, why not any other part of the world? This is a very lengthy discussion. And there's actually an entire book written on this called Qibla Numa. It's in Urdu. I think it's been translated in English, Allah knows best. And it was, trans it was written by a fantastic scholar from the Indian subcontinent, Malana Qasim Nanotwi Rahmatullahi Alayhi. So he wrote this book called Qibla Numa, and he actually wrote it. Why? Because one of the Hindu priests in India had challenged him to a debate, saying that you guys, you Muslims, you condemn idol worshipping, but you worship the Kaaba. So Maulana Qasim Nanotwi accepted his challenge for a debate. He even went to his town. He announced that I'm here. He didn't come out. He stayed there for about 15 days. The opponent still didn't come out. So then he returned to his village and he wrote a book. And the book is a few hundred pages long about why Allah instructed Muslims to face the Qibla, uh, Kaaba in Salah. What is the philosophy behind it? And very, very short summary I'm going to give you of just a few points. The short summary is that first and foremost, Allah says in one part of Al-Baqarah that the east and the west belongs to Allah. Wherever you face, Allah is there. And piety is not that you face the east or the west. The piety is that you believe in Allah. So these are numerous verses in the same chapter, Surah Al-Baqarah. So the point being made here is that it's not that if you face the Qibla, the Kaaba, that's the only direction you're going to find Allah in. That's not the idea behind the direction that we face in Salah. The idea is, and the philosophy is, that the hearts of all the believers worldwide be in one direction in the salah. And that is so important. The Rasulullah said, we shouldn't even leave gaps in the prayer because what happens? Your hearts will become, shaitan will infiltrate the rows and your hearts will become divided. That's the, the amount of emphasis Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laid on straightening the rows and removing the gaps, filling the voids. And sometimes we come in brothers and, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes I feel like brothers don't want to stand close to brothers. I don't know what it's like in the sisters area, but sometimes when you walk in and you see people have already started the salah and there's so many gaps between people's shoulders and you think, don't you want to rub shoulders with your brother? What's wrong with you? I don't know why this mentality that we have sometimes that like everybody's just uh, concerned about their I don't know their clothes or I don't know what it is Allah knows best I'm just uh, maybe it's cultural I don't know I, and I think it's important for us to remove that Alhamdulillah you have Muslim brothers stand next to them stand shoulder to shoulder with them these are your brothers inshallah you stand together on judgment day in front of Allah 
These are the people that inshallah you'll be resurrected with Who you prayed with inshallah You'll be standing together in front of Allah So this is a, a good thing We should always stand closer together Closer to one another So for the believers hearts to be combined And connected in one direction Pulled in one direction right? Because the only thing The strongest thing that binds us together is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Nothing else not ethnicity, not any flag of any country, nothing else. The strongest uh, uh, um, thing that ties us together, bounds us together, uh, 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 is La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And the greatest manifestation of that is the most sacred part of this earth, where Allah's light. His barakah, his nur, his rahmah, his mercy descends and reflects. That is the Kaabatullah. That is the Al Masjid al Haram. So, this is something to, uh, inshallah, remember may Allah Azza wa Jal grant us tawfiq. We're going to share next week some details about Ashab al Sufa. Because you're going to hear this term Ashab al Sufa so many times in the Seerah story of Medina. Who are the Ashab al Sufa? Why were they called Ashab al Sufa? Where is Sufa? What were their qualities? Some of those things, inshallah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Wa nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk.